Hello, and welcome to The Mind of a Therapist, a podcast where I interview psychotherapists and helping professionals and what they're passionate about in order to provide you with messages of encouragement and hope. I'm your host, Andrew Earl. The Mind of a Therapist is sponsored by Psychological Counseling Services, healing hearts and transforming lives. Look into our intensive at pcsrl.com. In today's episode, I interview Greta Enriquez. Greta graduated with an MA in Psychology and Counseling from Goddard College in 2013. Greta has over eight years of experience as a life coach, tutor, and mentor, and five years providing professional and personal development seminars focused on psychological, developmental, and educational issues. She is currently a doctoral candidate for a PhD in Interdisciplinary Studies in Humanities and Culture with certificates in Women and Gender and Creative Writing. Greta is a social justice advocate and uses her clinical and academic experiences to inform her work. Creative writing, storytelling, and fine art contribute to Greta's overall approach, with a focus on the client's needs and the way in which he or she understands their goals. So without further ado, here's the interview with Greta. So Greta, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. Um, You've uh, grounded your your work in gestalt narrative and expressive therapies. Will you just kind of give our listeners a brief overview of each of those theories and approaches? Uh, I will do my best. (laughs) Um, (laughs) It's a big question. (laughs) (laughs) So um, gestalt orientation in, in psychotherapy is for me, uh, and I can only speak for me, every Gestalt therapist will probably give you a different answer, um, is approaching um, my clients and whatever needs to happen for that client with a spirit of experimentation and curiosity. Um, So we work a lot with, I I work a lot with perspective, um, seeing the interactions between what the body is feeling, what the mind is thinking, and what we do with those sensations and, and cognitions. Um, and then see if we can shift our focus and bring some other things forward or move some other things into the background as, hmm. as the issue or the problem or however you want to frame it um, comes forward. Um, and then narrative therapy for me, I love storytelling. I love hearing stories. I love witnessing the stories that my clients allow me to to be present with um, with them. And so the the um, sort of focus I take in that perspective is that i I am the keeper of that story for them. And so when my narrative approaches is is using language and using imagery and metaphor, to help my clients rewrite their stories hmm. and and shift the focuses in their stories so that they can experience healing that way. Hmm. And then for me, expressive therapies runs runs a big gamut. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Everything from sand tray to psychodrama to music to to play. Even with my adult clients, um, I use a lot of play. Hmm. Um, whether it's actually going outside and like playing with a ball or you know, learning how to juggle or playing with embroidery string or <laughs> uh, any number of things. Um, art uh, comes a lot into that space as well. So I use a lot of nonverbal techniques as well as the narrative therapy um, linguistic techniques hmm. um, and sort of shift that, frame that all within the gestalt uh, perspective of that experimentation and curiosity. Hmm. Will you um, give some examples of uh, some experiences people have had with play, art, some of that those expressive um, experiences that have been therapeutic and healing? Um. So let me see. Let me think. Think of a case study in my head. Um. <laughs> um when okay so i'm thinking of a particular client um that we kept getting sort of stuck 
in in the language of things and in the the words that people had said or that she she had thought. Um, so we got a blank piece of of paper and crayons, and we just started drawing lines randomly on the paper. Hmm. Um, and with each sensation or each um, thought that came up, she would grab a different color and start with a different line. And by the time we were done, it was this beautiful collage of all of these different lines that had moved into different kinds of shapes. Um, and we sat back and, and looked at it together and she could see the map of her life in in the in that random abstract line drawings um and it helped her to to move into a space where she got to pick which line she wanted to travel um and had a very clear sense um outside of outside of all the words um and outside of all the memories that she had she had this very clear sense that she could then direct herself along this map hmm um, and so it gave her a sense of, of feeling empowered in her own healing. Hmm. Um, and so she started to make some different choices, very subtle at first. Um, uh, but to see where she's gone with it, it's just been amazing. Hmm. And so that's a real simple sort of art intervention. Um, paint is one of those uh, mediums that, because it's so fluid, um, can really open up. Um, a lot of emotional space that um, isn't hindered by by lines on a page or 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 what we think of as syntax and grammar and that kind of stuff. It mm -hmm. it it gives us fluidity um, so that that some of the individuals I work with um, using paint um, have been able to. Um, begin to nuance their emotional um senses hmm. by by being able to like get their hands in the paint and like smear it around and change hmm. what it looks like and blend it differently it's it's really kind of incredible to see it i love that I idea of play and art and um what's coming to mind for me is just how powerful um imagery is um as you were saying you know i think language is is very powerful too but um the thing that I'm really drawn to with uh, those sorts of expressive therapies, art therapies, is is expressing yourself with with images and just mm -hmm. how powerful that can be. Someone in a for in a way that wor words can't quite uh, encapsulate. Exactly. Um, I know for me, I spend. I'm a writer as well, so I spend a lot of time trying to get the right words. Mm. And in the therapeutic context, we I, we can kind of get trapped by that, trying to find the right word rather than just expressing. Mm. So when we move into these non-linguistic modes of, of expression, um, can really open up through imagery and through metaphor and, and physical metaphor even. Mm. Um, you know, things can stand in for other, symbolically can stand in for other things. Um, things you can't name because the word isn't there or the it's not mm. clear. Mm -hmm. um, you can have represented by, you know, the splotch on the paper or if we're doing sand tray, um, all the different objects or even tracings in the sand itself um, can can be representative of, of things that we don't have the words for. Mm. So <laughs> moving into to the non-linguistic spaces while still bringing in the storytelling and the, the, the more language-based things, um, you start to see an integration. Mm. Um, if from in, in the way we talk about in our younger selves or in our younger parts mm. Um, mm -hmm. into our present self. Mm. Um, and so there's this beautiful flow that, that comes out. Um, and it's a, it's a different kind of process than um, some typical uh, talk therapy modalities, mm -hmm. um, specifically because it brings in body language and it brings in imagery and it brings in the, the, the sensations that come up that we don't have language for mm -hmm. can then be represented and, and, and played with and experimented with. Mm. Um, we can have a curiosity about it, um, which for me is 
um, one of the foundations to to healing. Mm, absolutely. To, to move through the fear into a space of, of, of a joyful fear because curiosity is fear and joy mixed together. Mm. And so we get that anticipation of stumbling onto something um, that can, even though it, it may not be a, a big major shift, can shift something just enough. Hmm. Will you speak more to that? Just enough. Yeah. Sorry. Will you speak more to that? Just the that that subtle shift or that just enough shift? Maybe some examples or what you've seen that look like in maybe your life, friends' lives, or um, people who have consulted you's lives. Um. Well, for me in my own journey, um, I I have very rarely in doing my own work, my own therapeutic work, um, had those big aha moments. Mm. Um, there, I've not had that sort of sensationalized, like, oh, that explains my whole life. I understand now. <laughs> sure. um, they've they've sure. been more like, oh, I'm holding my breath around this person. Or I'm holding my breath when this thing happens. Mm-hmm. And what if I just gave myself permission to breathe mm. in that space? Mm. And so it's it's just enough shift for me in, in, in my own process to allow whatever feelings of anxiousness or sadness may have come up to, mm. to dissipate themselves. Mm. Um, and it's those kinds of subtle shifts um, and the just enoughs mm. that have, have taken me through some amazing, my own you know, amazing therapeutic journey, but mm. have given, has given me tools to bring into to session with my clients too. Hmm. Um, Oh, do you notice, you know, you're sitting with your shoulders all slumped up um, like you're guarding, you're guarding your chest and your belly. What happens if you just open your shoulders a little bit Mm -hmm. and that kind of subtle shift Hmm. in that space? Yeah. Hmm. I appreciate that. And, and I, I mentioned this in a, a previous podcast, and I just think it, it, it stood out to me so much, this idea that you're talking about. Um, Michael White has a quote of, um, it's it's not the size of the step that matters, you know, but the direction, you know, for people. And that's just stuck with me. And as you were speaking, I, I relate so much to what you're saying, it's just in my personal journey. Um, just those small, small steps. And I was just talking with Scott Miller too, and, and he was, we, we, we talked about like Irvin Yalom's work on the, the lifelong journey metaphor, you know, and mm-hmm. um, how, whether it's in our professional life, personal life, um, uh, it's, you know, it's a lifelong journey, you know, and uh, it's it, all about those, those incremental steps that you're talking about. Yeah, the um, I had I had the the fabulous experience of going to evolutionary uh, evolution of psychotherapy conference a couple of years ago, mm. and and sitting with people like Scott Miller and um, Robert Diltz and uh, Bill O'Hanlon and and Gene Houston and and these fabulous um, psychotherapists who are also storytellers, mm. um, and and bringing bringing that sense of the hero's journey is um, not, not for the extraordinary. It's mm-hmm. for the ordinary. Mm. Um, you know, Phil Simbardo talks about that um, quite a bit and, and bringing that into the everyday. And so we can always go through these, these small cathartic changes as we recognize um, the individual steps of our journey along the way. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what else has been, uh, catching your attention these days or what, what else do, what do you want to share with our listeners here? Um, oh no, I just like blanked. My whole mind just went, no, <laughs> <laughs> I understand um, that. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, the thing that's been coming up most for me, um, on my everyday, uh, during all of this you know, COVID stuff and, Mm. and, and the shifts that we're seeing is a reminder to be gentle, be Mm. gentle with ourselves and be gentle with everyone else too. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. That, that's something that I've um, recently been finding so important is that 
gentleness or or care for myself i've been realizing recently that it's so important for me to to practice you know really into that the incremental steps it's just incremental practice of having that caring and gentle posture with myself and then that has been making it easier for me to have more gentleness and care with others so yeah yeah i really appreciate that message yeah, and to to mm-hmm. take it slow too. Mm. There's, you know, we don't have to be at a a rapid pace. Mm. It's mm-hmm. as much as a breath, and when our breath is nice and slow, then we can do the work that we need to do, whatever that happens to be. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. Um, is is there anything else um on the topic of uh narrative therapy or or gestalt that um you'd like to to share with our listeners? Um, uh, the work that I've been doing, um, I'm in the process of completing my dissertation now too. Um, the work that I've been doing has been combining gestalt narrative and somatic experience, Hmm. um, into memoir and into autobiographical storytelling. Hmm. Um, so, uh, a big portion of my, my work as a therapist involves, uh, problems with identity Mm -hmm. or, um, shifting notions of identity as we move through the lifespan. Um, and mm. so um, moving into a space where I'm taking um, the contact boundaries that we have. So in Gestalt, we have this thing called contact, and that's where perception happens. Um, and that there's these three layers of contact, um, us with the environment, us with others, and us with ourselves. Mm. And and we tell stories that involve all three components as we tell our our life stories and our personal um, narratives. And so bringing bringing recognition back into what the body tells us Hmm. as we tell stories from memory, because we 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 recall to our bodies the memories that we have. Hmm. And so how to incorporate that and make shifts even in, in, in that space um in in the process of healing sometimes it's 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 an acceptance of what happened but there's also i can shift my perspective about it i don't have to stay in the spaces of hurt or sadness or grief or anger um i can shift those perspectives so that it doesn't impact me so greatly in the present moment anymore Hmm. um and so, so bringing that awareness into the narrative therapeutic process, which to me is like revolutionized narrative therapy for me. Mm. Um, mm. It, it makes it more embodied um, and, and honors, honors all of the, the uh, pieces of our story, both the linguistic and the nonverbal. Mm. Um, because our stories live in us, even as we tell our stories. And so bringing those pieces together has been super exciting. Mm. Um, and I am excited to continue doing more of that work as well. Hmm. Yeah, so you were talking about um, a, a shift there that uh, people, you've seen people make. Or um, will, you, will you talk more about that, what, what that looks like? Um, I, well, it can happen on, on a number of different levels. Um, I've st- I've seen it in how a person holds their body or moves. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, they may swing their arms a little differently or make a different hand gesture than they had previously, or even just raise, raise the chin up a little bit and the voice gets back in the body. Um, One of the things that I've noticed people um, there with people that I work with, um, where the voice gets placed um, can sometimes sound like it's outside of their heads <laughs> mm. or outside of their bodies. Um, and so the vocal shift that I've noticed is that the voice comes back into the body. Mm. Um, and there's, there's a, there's a beautiful clarity in, in, in that shift that, uh, that I've heard, you can hear it over time. It's, it's amazing. Um, it may be in the use of certain words. Um, 
if they've come in and and they're the always every never kind of situation um and and there's a shift in in the use of those words so that they're using always every and never less often and using words like sometimes um which is is one of those real subtle shifts right sure. but it's 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 it gives tremendous freedom um it gives a uh, choice back to the storyteller it gives it to the client right it gives this this sense that yeah it may have been that way that time mm -hmm. but it's not that way all the time and i can now start to be more accountable to my own process and how that impacts whether the the thing happens again or not what what do you think accounts for uh people's ability to step from those sorts of understandings from always, you know, to, um, sometimes. Um, <clears throat> I think it, 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 it can be a number of different things. Mm -hmm. One of them is the desire for things to be different than they are. Mm. Um, and so they get to a space where, where they may be willing to just experiment if I try this for a week and nothing happens, then we try a different thing. Mm. But if I try this for a week, I'm already starting to build a new habit in my languaging, mm -hmm. which is shifting my perspective already. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes it can be they've tried all of they've not all of the other tools, but they've tried a, other other therapeutic modalities and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, or they didn't find it in fact uh, uh, effective or impactful for them. And so they're just willing to try something new. Hmm. Um, and, and in that willingness, it's that willingness and that hope for change, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we get back mm -hmm. to the common factors. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, having, having space with, with me in my, in my therapeutic sessions, having the space to not only fall down or um, try different things, um, but the space to, to stand up in that, that sense of empowerment and that sense of self-assertion, mm. um, and that self sense of self-efficacy mm. that, um, there's that freedom there. And so we get the paradox of freedom, right? Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you give the space and, and, and the room to play. Um, and really that's how I approached a lot of my, my, my therapy is, um, come at it with a, with a play, hmm. come at it with curiosity, hmm. um, and, and reconnect to, to seeing it from a new space. Hmm. Even if it's something that you've already done, let's see if we can shift it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. No, I appreciate that. And I, I just, I love your, your focus on like experimentation and, and play and, um, and those sorts of, I love that you broke down those different, types of shifts that you see people make with whether it's bodily voice use of language and um yeah i think that it's it's such an interesting field that we're we're in where i was talking with my my grandpa recently he's been in the field for um i think six decades now and and he was wow. echoing the same thing that you're talking about with like it's such a cool field to be able to have play and fun in a session and then also you know share tears with someone in a session yeah. just there's such a wide range of experiences and and sometimes that's that's what happens you know when we we open we open a space that's been closed for so long mm -hmm. um and and even though the opening of the space is good we still grieve what we were holding on to too mm. And so being able to sit with our clients and, and cry with them and laugh with them and sing with them and dance with them and make little things out of Play-Doh, <laughs> <laughs> um, just getting into the, the real tactile, um, making, making what's going on in our heads super tactile and, and visual and and giving us a chance to, to look at it differently. And, and so we get this play and we get, you know, play, play can be scary too. Mm. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we played manhunt and, and 
uh, cops and robbers and stuff like that. You never know if somebody is going to jump out from behind something or what's in the dark room or, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but it's still play. Right. And so bringing that, that ex- it, not excitement, but that sense of curiosity mm. um, in, in, into places where it's been scary to be curious. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I was really interested as you were talking earlier about um, identity and um, your work uh, involves uh, creating a space for people to reflect on that autobiographically. Will you expand Mm -hmm. on that a little bit more? So um, I work from the perspective that um, our identity is the story that we tell ourselves, Hmm. essentially. Or foundationally, I want to stay away from the word essential. It's one of the things I'm working on. Um, <laughs> and um, and so when when we get into the habits of telling particular life moments, um, we sort of get entrenched in the language that we use. Then too, like you could tell the same story in, in ten or fifteen different crowds of people and tell the same story, right? Mm-hmm. There's we get uh, almost like we've grabbed onto the script mm-hmm. and and editing the script is 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 taboo. Mm. In the process of the work that I do, um, we are essentially workshopping that script. So we bring it down, um, we talk about the component parts, what physically happened, um, what the scene was like. Um, so we give like all the stage cues essentially. Um, and then we give what the body feelings were then and what the body feelings are now mm. as you're telling that story. Mm-hmm. Um, and so honoring, honoring that space of, um, this has impacted me. I'm telling this story today and this thing happened, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, and it still has me feeling something in my body and in my mind and in my emotions. Um, and so making that more clear mm-hmm. um, is sort of the first step. And then um, bringing that play um, and, and experimentation into, into the process by looking at the memory from the perspective of the rock you tripped on, so mm-hmm. to speak, or looking at it from the perspective of the bird that flew by um, or, or looking at the scene differently so that we're, it's not an I space for a little while. It's a, it's a he, she, it space. Mm. Um, so that we get less attached to the script mm-hmm. so we can get some freedom in it. Um, and then we bring it back into that I space again. Mm. And, and look at the language that we're using and, and try experimenting with some um, uh, <laughs> synonyms or um, different ways of saying the same thing, bringing that spirit of metaphor mm-hmm. in, and symbolism into, that, um, into the story itself. And then seeing what, seeing what happens, seeing what the shifts are as we start to look at my, our, our I am's from a different perspective. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that was really interesting what you were saying about the um the moving it from the I space to a, a he she it space. And so by that what I was grasping out with what you're saying was it's what was um yeah, the rock that you tripped over his perspective or would it also be like what was another person's um what would you imagine they would have thought? How would they have seen a situation? Is 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 that something that you do as well? Um, I I tend to steer away from the challenges to mind read others. Mm. Um. So when we when I bring the story into the the he she it space or the third person voice, um. We want we take out anything that wasn't actually revealed. Mm-hmm. So if it wasn't said, it doesn't get said. Mm-hmm. But there's the description of the facial movements. Um, there would be the description of how the body moved. 
like if my understanding was so and so was mad at me mm -hmm. um and um that's that's the the framework that i've been um thinking about this person for you know however many years um that they're they're always angry at me so we get that word always um if we take a particular scene okay so describe to me what that person was doing what did their face look like did they say anything specific mm -hmm. so if they didn't speak those words aren't going to enter into the script Um, so we're, we're looking at how the individual who's experienced, who experienced the thing or is telling this memory, um, what their perception of that person was mm. without the mind reading piece in there. Mm -hmm. Um, and so f for me, at least it's, it's a, it's a pretty, um, critical part to steer away from my mom always said this about me or my dad always said this about me or so-and-so always said this about me to, to step away from someone else's words that have been internalized hmm. to find so that the storyteller themselves can find their own voice. Hmm. Oh, absolutely. So um, we're, we're getting towards the end of the interview here. Is there anything that we, we haven't covered that, that you really want to share? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I actually got to talk a little bit more about my, my own research more than I thought that I would, Love it. <laughs> which is just super exciting. <laughs> Great. Well, the, the question I like to pose at the end of the end of the interview is what's a message of hope that you'd like to leave the listener with? Hmm. That's a good one. Um, for me, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna be my motto. Um, Be the person you needed when you were a kid. Hmm. No. And we can make a lot of change that way. Hmm. No. And we can facilitate a lot of healing that way, I think. Hmm. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Greta. Um, if people are interested in uh, getting in touch with you, where's the best place to direct them? Um, it would be to my email probably <laughs> um i can be reached at um g-r-e-t-a-e -E at sagestonenc.com perfect s-a-g-e-s-t-o-n-e-n-c -E -E <laughs> perfect perfect great well thanks so much again for being on the podcast and uh have a great rest of your day You too. Thank you for having me, Andrew. Please press the subscribe button, as well as rating and review in our podcast. This helps others connect with what you've been hearing. If you have any questions, please contact us at themindofatherapist at gmail.com. These questions will be kept anonymous. I want to thank Eric Price for the wonderful music you hear in this podcast. Additionally, this podcast was created to provide accurate and authoritative information on the subject matter. Although we are interviewing licensed therapists, they are not your therapists. This podcast is not intended to serve as direct medical advice and should not be used as a substitute for direct professional help. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, publisher, guests, or PCS are rendering legal, clinical, or other professional information. If you need a professional, we encourage you to find one. Visit Psychology Today to connect with a licensed clinician near you. Lastly, I wanted to mention that Psychological Counseling Services is currently offering teletherapy. If you're interested in therapy at this time, please visit PCSEarl.com. As long as there is a state of emergency in place, PCS will be offering teletherapy.